join me in welcoming the filmmakers of My Scientology Movie, director John Dower, producer Simon Chin, and Louis Theroux. get on stage before the applause meters out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, so, Louis. Yes. This was made in 2015. So, um, what is the aftermath between then and now? With, with well, the, from the Church of Scientology? It was, to, to be fair, it was made really it was shot between the beginning of 2013 and the beginning of 2014. It was developed over the course of arguably 10 years before that, but in earnest for about two years leading up to 2013. And um, we're now 2016. And you can see they come after me, uh, us as a production. And in fact, Marty um, is, the, is the main a recipient of the attention from the church. Since making it, little things have happened, and there's an ongoing, scary kind of um, legal scrutiny that anything that is published, anything I say, anything John or Simon tweets or publishes, anything that, you know in a program for a festival, that will be on the radar of the Church of Scientology, and they will be looking for slip-ups and ways to... Um, worry us, you know, and, and grounds for legal suits. So that's sort of the main thing that's going on. It was on our radar, actually. We I'm sure to, it was. We had to have the copy approved by the Church of Scientology. They actually approved it themselves? Well, they need to have, they need to have it run by. We couldn't use our own original generated copy. So you got the Church of Scientology to write the copy? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Would you add anything to to that, John? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have many Twitter followers, so it's it's not been a, a bigger deal for me as it has been for you. Um, when we were in the London Film Festival, they did send a legal letter objecting to the way the film had been written up in the festival brochure, and we were like, well, we didn't write it. You know, that that, that happens. You know, so there's quite strange things like that, but... You know, joking apart, I think what we had, even when we were making the film, we didn't have on a scale that happened to our contributors. I mean, you know, Marty had them living outside his house doing that squirrel busting for a year. I mean, imagine that. It was it became pretty tedious after a few days. Although, obviously gave us some great footage, which we're not going to complain about. But, yeah, you've, you've had a couple of odd incidents. Should I talk about an odd incident? Yeah, come on. So, so, so this will give you an idea of their playbook. Um, I, uh, I was at home a couple of months ago on a Sunday morning in my pajamas making pancakes for the kids and the doorbell went and it was the police and they came in and said, well, we're here to help you because we've been told uh, there are people who want to hurt you. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, there's been a serious threat of violence to you and it's been... Um, and we just want you to be on your guard so that, you know, have you seen anything suspicious? And I said... Well, you know, I live in Halston, so uh, yeah, uh, there's people who, you know, doing violence. That's like a daily kind of reality, kind of. Like, I don't worry too much about being attacked, but there's all sorts of suspicious, weird activity. But um, I said, why do? You, what makes you think I might be I I under any sort of more than normal threat? And he, he said, well, we had a threat phoned in by the Church of Scientology in East Grinstead, and they were worried you might be hurt. Someone, they said, someone had seen your film, and they really didn't like it. And they'd phoned them with a threat that they wanted to pass on and they were worried about you. And I said, um, that, you know, something about that really doesn't make any sense because if someone wants to threaten me, they can threat. There's so many ways of doing it. They could, you know, do it to me on Twitter or through the BBC. They could phone my agent. They could just find out where I live and threaten me in person. To threaten me through the Church of Scientology is kind of weird. And... Um, I said, uh, my take on it, and I may be wrong, is that the Church of Scientology is actually indirectly making life uncomfortable for me. But to be honest with you, I felt kind of 
pleased I saw, I thought, God, they're still using those old school kind of silly tactics to threaten, you know, like I actually quite liked it. Um, <laughs> the, the more scary one is, uh, without going into details, like tweets that I've sent, um, not tweets, a tweet. I don't want to talk, I can't talk too much about it because it's still... But we don't have our lawyer here, so you can't. <laughs> but uh, you just have to be very careful what you say. <laughs> That's really great. What's the what is the upshot with Marty? Are you in touch with him or? You take that. Go on. Oh, you always give me that one. Um, Marty um, has seen the film. Obviously, there are bits of the film that he likes. There are bits of the film he doesn't like, which I think you know, as expected. I think I'd be a little disappointed if he loved the whole film. I mean, he he was kind of amazing for us in that he had this strange role that developed in the film where he became more than just a, a, a you know a, a traditional documentary contributor he became this sort of he was a sort of consultant almost at the casting process we we improvised a scene based on something he'd written so he he was in this strange position where he was almost part of the process and yet we always made it very clear that Louis wanted to explore him, which doesn't really happen in any of the other Scientology films, which I think was important for our film because in some of the other films, which are great films, but they kind of take what these guys say, you know, they're sort of traditional whistleblowers. Everything they say is 100%. And it's like, well, they were in there a long time. As Louis kept asking him many times. <laughs> In the exercises in the uh, enactment, is that just one take, like your staring contest that you have? You're interested in my staring competition? That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm very good at, uh, you know, <clears throat> it turns out I'm good at, like, Scientology drills. And, um, uh, and the staring was not a problem. And actually, like, I've, you know, people say, like, oh, your wife's having sex uh, right now in the other room. Uh, fine, you know. Um, you know, you're a geek and you're an asshole and, you know, you're a total loser and everything you've done is lame. Yeah, fine. Like, you know, that's just daily life for me. I could do that all day, uh, all day long. Sudden loud noises I have a problem with. Uh, but it was an important moment for me because, you know, having, um, I think any moment where we're attempting in good faith to reenact something uh, and actually feel real about it, like those were the most valuable um, reenactments for me. And so it was a special, and also I'd been thinking about doing this film for so long to actually, uh, to actually kind of be doing that, like doing Scientology sort of for real was a special thing. We actually shot, you know, in terms of sort of things on the cutting room floor, there's a lot, there's a whole world of independent Scientologists, people who, um, a bit like um, breakaways from, say, the Catholic Church, you know, and they go and form their own little, you know, we're still Christian, but we just don't believe in the Pope kind of thing. And that exists in Scientology where we like LRH's teachings, we just don't want to, we don't believe in where the uh, Church of Scientology is at now, we don't like David Miscavige, we don't want to pay thousands and thousands of dollars. So we actually, for a while, thought maybe that was an interesting avenue. But it turns out once you take out the, the kind of slightly Stalinist, oppressive um, dimension, it stops being that interesting. And we, we went to Pasadena and shot a morning where I did Scientology with a kind of cuddly uh, crew of ex-Scientologists. And I don't know, it just wasn't very interesting, was it? So that was a special day when Marty was doing And actually, in general, I think it's Marty's steely, slightly Scientology-drilled edge. You know, his scary edge is what I think imbues the film with a kind of sense of seriousness and a sense of it not being um, just straw men. You know, like I, certainly when I was making it, when we were making it, I was always aware that we were on a tightrope with Marty, and it felt like... You know, no, on his various trips out to L.A., there was always at least one moment when it felt he was on the verge of saying, do you know what, you're a fucking asshole, and you can fuck off, and I'm not coming out again. Like, that was more or less... Every trip. Every trip, that moment happened, and, like, I would somehow, without meaning to, wind him up, and, um, and John would have to sort of talk him back down again. Yes. <laughs> so is he, does his wife still work for the you church? Talk about how you would do that. <laughs> that would be pretty dull, I think. 
<laughs> I was saying, does his wife still work for the Church of Scientology as their PR person? Who, Marty's? Yes. Well, Marty's wife, uh, he had a wife. Uh, is, do you mean, I think you mean his ex-wife. Yeah, his ex-wife. His ex-wife is still in Scientology. Uh, they've all got ex-wives. They've all There's got a sort of Scientology ex-wives club. So, obviously, you see Catherine, who we meet outside the base, is Jeff's ex-wife. One, um, one of the people who squirrel bust Marty at the LAX airport... Um, who looks a bit like... Um, Elaine from Seinfeld. I like Veep, yeah. Or v Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Yeah. She w was actually married to Tom DeVocht, who we go and meet in the film. So there is a sort of Scientology... It's a flaw in the film, I'd say, that we got, you know, we got, sort of over, we got too many male contributors, but the kind of weird paradox is that all, like their first wives seem to be still in the church and kind of coming out and interbulating us in scary ways. So that redresses the balance a tiny bit, doesn't it? I'm not sure it does. <laughs> that would be a good sort of DVD extra, the, 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 the Scientology Wives Club, maybe. <laughs> Possibly quite a short film. <laughs> Two minutes. Have, let's take some questions. Yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, How about um, Sir in the corner? <laughs> oh, <do you> want... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, come on. Sorry, I have to Use make your way. Use tone 40. <laughs> <laughs> um, how inspired were you stylistically by the uh, act of killing? Was that an influence? Um, and is Joshua, is he one of the execs? Or is that a coincidence, the um, surname? The, film. the last bit again. The, uh, with Joshua Oppenheimer an exec, or was that just a Joe coincidence? Oppenheimer. Yeah. Joe Josh. Oppenheimer, different Oppenheimer. Ah. Co oh, different. total coincidence, different Oppenheimer, Joe Oppenheimer. But um, for my own part, you know, certainly the idea of reenactments had come out, had come up before I'd ever seen the act of killing. Um, quite early on, uh, we, we said, you know, maybe there's ways of reenacting things. And it was only, uh, but I will say this, that when I saw the act of killing, it kind of brought into focus the, the reenactment idea and specifically showed me how um, these things can work as long, because the, the challenge is for it not to feel like a, a, a stunt, something that we're doing to be funny. And the, and the idea was we need to ground it in something re real and that uh, it should feel that it's, you know, what's so brilliant about the act of killing is you don't really feel Josh Oppenheimer's presence in the film. The, the, the reenactments, for, for those of you who haven't seen The Act of Killing, it's about Indonesian genocide in the 60s, and they, they take ex-genocidal killers who are now celebrated, and they, they, the, 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 geno the, the killers themselves direct the reenactments. So the idea was like, well, we absolutely need our ex-scientologists to lead and to direct and to sort of own the whole process of the reenactments. That was the big thing for me. But John had seen some Iranian films um, <laughs> that I'm sure he'd be pleased to tell you about in like in a subcommittee. <laughs> yeah, the, I when I, I had, had actually not seen the Act of Killing when we first talked about the reenactments, and I mean, the Act of Killing is an amazing film. I've got a couple of issues with it, but I won't bore you with that here. But, but you know, it's been done before in documentaries. You know, I mean, you know, going right back to sort of Peter Watkins and films like Punishment Park, and and a lot of Iranian films do it. You know, um, Close Up, one of my favourites. A Moment of Innocence. Yes. So, but it, it did feel motivated for this subject. You know, here is a religion. You know, founded in Hollywood by a guy. You know, L. Ron Hubbard. Wanted a, it was a wannabe director. You know, David Miscavige started as a camera operator in their own studio, Gold Studios. Their disciples are actors, etc. So it felt motivated. It wasn't just a, you know, a, a cheap stunt. And it kind of, and we didn't know if it was going to work. It was a complete, you know, shot in the dark, really. And the key thing was to enable Louis to try and tell the story in the present tense. Because when I came on, I mean, I turned this film... To, down a couple of times originally. You, you, you always like to mention that. <laughs> well, no, it's just a, it's it's just an a lot of these Q and A's. It's <laughs> not complete until John said that he turned it down a couple of times. But I think uh, you never asked if I turned it down. <laughs> well, you've been trying to make it for 10, 15 years, um, which was an, a kind of stupid thing to do, given you know, especially the stature of our producer, Mr. Simon Chin, and. <laughs> Obviously, Louis, who's especially in Belgium, is bordering on national treasure. But I was, 
I was really struggling with the idea. All of Louis's films, the brilliance of Louis in his films is when he, he's in the moment, he's in that present tense. Here we had a story with no fucking access at all, and he's not really going to do your sort of, here's a history of Scientology with archives, so how can we try and tell the story in, in the present tense? And the idea was that if we could bring Marty to al alive with these casts, and it, it kind of worked, mm. I think. I mean, you might, some of you might disagree. Um, I quite liked that the... I, I can imagine that the intimidation tactics can be quite unnerving, but I quite liked that it was kind of uh, quite laughable here. Mm. And, Louis, I'm sh sure you're kind of probably a bit more used to kind of having to deal with good reactions and mm -hmm. uh, negative reactions. But it's a, it's a question for John, actually, as as the filmmaker. Did, did Were you being intimidated outside of... The production and was it something that you had to consider or were other people behind the camera being targeted as well no the main target was louis i think because that's the uh that was the one of the other reasons i originally turned the film down was because i'd never worked with someone in front of the camera i couldn't really get my head around that although louis isn't a traditional presenter in, in any sense but here i suddenly realized well this is this is a good reason to have someone in front of the camera because he'll take all the the shit, which he kind of did. I mean, it, the intimidation was the only time they used to park. I think we were quite rubbish to begin with. I don't think we'd even noticed they were following us for a good few days. And then we did notice, and then we kind of saw them all the time. The only thing that, for that classic boring director thing, but they used to park around the corner from our hotel. And we were staying in quite a sort of, you know, Deliberately, nice sort of down at heel place. It would have been very easy to just walk through the double doors of one of our rooms and take the rushes. That was the thing that started to make me paranoid. So me and my DOP, Will, we'd sort of take a drive each and put them under our mattress. You know, classic, under the mattress. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, but that was... No, it was there, was... there was something quite ludicrous, essentially, about the... And as boring as it is, it really is the case that they tend to reserve most of their vindictiveness for ex-members, don't they? Especially ex-members that speak out. There's a reason why Marty was getting people coming up to him at the airport at LAX, and we never had that, did we? And um, even when I, at the end scene where I say to one of the guys... Um, what, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? And they said, I'm having a calm cycle with Marty. And so the idea is absolutely that they want to target ex-members. Uh, so as much as I'd like to take credit, or perhaps we all would, for uh, withstanding their um, negative attention, we didn't get anything like what most of our contributors got. Mark Headley. I mean, you saw that the, the, the one time they deliberately targeted us when they turned up outside the studio the day of the drills and it was just it was just as you see it's in the film it's just odd i mean for starters that woman is wearing incredibly inappropriate shoes to be on such a a mission you know she's wearing these huge platforms it, it was just it was just so bizarre you know louis asking them well what's your documentary on and people and it's people People. It's just about people. <laughs> okay, should we do another one? What, have we got time? Yes. Um, it was a fantastic film. I just wanted to ask about the young actors, because they were quite extraordinary, mm. especially the one who played the main character. Mm. When he took on that role in The Hole, I mean, were you a bit shocked at his amazing ability to reenact that? And also, how have they been affected by it subsequently? Have they had any problems? Because he was at that yeah. public road with you. Yeah. Have they faced any repercussions? Okay. So I think there was a journey we went on with the actors. I should, you know, we should give it up for uh, Andrew Perez, who does an amazing job as the role of David Miscavige. He certainly stood out at the first auditions. In the process of you know, auditioning the first bunch, and then when we went back for the Tom Cruise auditions, there were a few people who fell away uh, because they were advised by agents or on their own initiative decided it wouldn't be good for their careers to be in a film perceived as negative towards Scientology. So I think, and I think I understand that fear. I don't understand, I don't totally know how real it is. I, I doubt anyone is put on a, 
a blacklist because they've appeared in our documentary. I wouldn't like to think that it's affected um, Andrew Perez in any way. I think in general um, they had a good experience and that they will go on and have a good time. But were think? they not freaked out by it? Because some of the stuff they're having to do was quite weird for them, you know. Did it not freak were them they out? Freaked they out? were in a film, Jesus, in LA. That's a, that's a big know, deal. That's a I great mean, question. In a sense that, and I think what you get as well, and one of the things I think that works in it is that the process of inducting someone into a film is not massively different from inducting someone into a cult, if you like, and that um, there's a grooming process, there's a sense of specialness that you try to impart to the, to the young novitiates, and that you, uh, over time, you, you kind of instill in them a sense of shared purpose, and that by the end, they're so involved that you can get them to do um, all kinds of unlikely things. Would you, would you not agree? And on the thing about Andrew Perez, what was a revelation for me was seeing him the first time, you, that bit where I go, where did you get that from? He goes, I'm very good at, ch at channeling, uh, what does he say? Anger and righteousness. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that was, so when we, when we did it in the hole, I was totally ready for him to go loco. And, um, he, and, he and he did, and it was great. Thank God. I wanted him to do it again, and then John said, um, <laughs> you know, once was enough that he was triggering PTSD in some of the crew. <laughs> no, we were lucky. I mean, we were lucky with Andrew because it's, I mean, I've made a couple of commercials in the States, and, you know, you get actors. It's, I mean, it's, God, who'd be an actor? It's, and, you come in and you get like 30 seconds. And in this, some of them just embraced it because they saw that we were filming the actual auditions and they're like, hey, well, I've got a chance to be in a movie anyway. So some of them, but some of them found that in itself, not even the Scientology bit, the bit that they were being filmed in their auditions for a documentary, that they couldn't get their head around. And I think, but the ones that embraced it, particularly Andrew, I mean, he was, and you know, him and Marty developed a quite amazing relationship. Marty was, Brilliant with him, so it worked well. Next question. Oh, there's a lot now. They're kind of growing. What? I'm just wondering what Marty's motivation was to do it. Uh, it seems sometimes, not to defend Scientology, but given the opportunity to write the scripts and not have a little directorial input mm. in the, the reenactions, could be like a smear campaign to mm -hmm. get back to his disgruntled ex-boss maybe, or why did he do it? Uh, I think he did it because he... I think it's complicated and there's a lot of reasons. I think he's a sort of um, a man who went from being at the top of a vast multi-million uh, multi -million dollar church, right? A massive, with massive responsibility. And he was pushed... He, was, he left and he's now, you know, suddenly all of that's gone. And, and we're giving him the... We're saying, like, we'll put our vast resources at your disposal, and we want to tell your story, right? And um, I think that's massively seductive, you know? I mean, just to, uh, parenthetically, it's really striking how, you know, one of the imperatives f for staying within Scientology is you become orphaned once you leave. And, you, you know, you go from being someone who designs church buildings, you know, on a vast scale, or, or d designs PR campaigns, or, or does massive kind of spy-like special ops, as Marty did, and then suddenly you're out in the cold with like nothing on your resume except I was in a cult or a, a sort of new religious movement <laughs> for um, <clears throat> whichever you like uh, for 20 years. So I think it's you. You know, he's like, I'm, and it was really interesting to see how he took to being at, you know, having these sort of youngsters at his beck and call. Like he felt, it felt to me as though he was intoxicated by the idea of being back in the saddle in some way. Uh, I think he also has a sense of responsibility. He's trying to get his truth out there. He feels that he was sidelined and beguiled by something potentially toxic and dangerous, and, and now he's figured it out, and he, he very much wants to share the, share the wisdom that he's accumulated. Would you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> Let's take one more. Front row. Um, I think most people's fascination with Scientology is that it's quite a new religion. It's recent history that it was made. Did you approach it in the way that you would have approached Christianity or Islam? or did you? Because it almost felt like you were trying to infiltrate the Bilderberg group rather than a religion. Mm. That's a great question. That's, like, that's a great question. Because that's what the Scientologists said to us quite a lot. 
uh, would you do this if it was um, Justin Welby? You know, would you have people auditioning to play Justin Welby using disgruntled ex-members of the Anglican Church? And, and what's your thought on that, John? Well, I thought was is that Justin Welby would probably give us an interview. <laughs> uh, he'd at least talk to us. We did, I mean, we did have some quite serious conversations about, well, is this blasphemous to get a, you know, a, 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 an actor in Hollywood to play the leader of a church? We obviously decided we didn't think it was. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, Justin... Not that I'm that keen to make a film on Justin Welby, but um, that was the example they kept giving in their many, 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 many legal letters. But the difference is, is that Justin Welby would probably speak to you, or you'd have more than one interview to go on. Well, and, and also that there aren't, you know, multiple long-term ex-staff members of Justin Welby's that are making credible allegations that they were physically abused by him. And I think the, um, you know, I think it's a great point. I'm glad that's the last question because I feel it goes to the heart of the matter in a way. And that, um, you know, it's, it was crucial that we should not be seen to be taking, that we should not be taking cheap shots at Scientology because a lot of it is odd, but, but religion is by its very nature odd. And, you know, I, I, I tried to take it, uh, you know, interrogate my our own methods as we went along and think about would we do this to the Anglican Church or indeed Buddhism or, if you like, um, Islam, you know? And we're all schooled. And Islam, especially because of the current climate, to sort of exercise sensitivity about, well, to depict uh, the Prophet Muhammad, for example, or and, 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 and to what extent are things that we think outside the religion seem slightly... Uh, unusual, but but to pr actual believers seem deeply ingrained. So we made a decision that we wouldn't reveal uh, the teachings at uh, the OT3 level, which you know other documentaries rejoice in in, in telling you the details of because they're particularly outlandish and weird sounding to the uninitiated. And so and w and when we do the drills, it was very much with the idea that we should try to make them, you know authentic and that Marty as the ex inspector general is well qualified for them to feel orthodox that it's not um, you know because the danger is you have someone hey you're an ex-catholic well what we're going to do is like we're going to get some uh, crackers well we can't find any crackers so we'll just use uh, breakfast cereal and we'll reenact this thing that you call communion so I'm going to come up and and you know it would be absurd like what would you possibly learn from um, going through the motions of like some sacred reenactment like that so the idea is absolutely for Marty to be signed up and believing in. He's not doing that in order to satirize Scientology. He's doing that in order to say that I've distilled this. This is what I've learned from Scientology, and this is a good faith attempt to give you some of the benefit that I've experienced. So I do feel as though, uh, uh, and, and the, I think the last point of that is that is, uh, there is something, you know, notwithstanding that it's so um, new, because there are other new religions. Scientology is particularly unusual. It's a confluence of a number of different cultural factors to do with its involvement of a kind of UFO belief, uh, a, a kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of corporate a attitude, you know, to do with increasing revenue that's based on a kind of McDonald's-style uh, sales system that also involves a sort of, you mentioned the Bilderbergers, but this inculcated sense of secrecy, you know, where they don't, they're, they're acting, that part of their belief is that you really need to behave as though you're on, um, you know, you have what they call shore stories. You have to have cover stories that you have to behave as though no one should know what you're doing. There's a sort of spy-like um, component to it. So all these different flavors, religious, corporate, uh, UFO. Self-help as well. Well, yeah, self-help as well, yeah are all combined. So, you know, there is something quite weird about Scientology. <laughs> yes. Good note to end on. I'm sorry, we're going to have to conclude, but thank you so much.